Student doctors Higano, Tampton, and Huang will present a study which focuses on holistically examining the effects and health outcomes of methamphetamine use in a patient population that is already inherently vulnerable. These health outcomes include prevalence of acute illness, chronic disease, dental health, and consistency and frequency of health care. They've used surveys by non-drug users, recovered users, and current users, and employed statistical data analysis in order to find any significant correlations that may be present. In addition, uh, these student doctors and myself have uh, obtained cheek swabs to analyze various types of oral bacteria in the mouth to determine the extent to which certain ones may be associated with meth use. The overall goal of this study is to bring attention to a paper patient population that is often overlooked in healthcare in an attempt to identify if certain oral bacteria can aid in predicting and preventing ultimately dental health outcomes. Student doctors, take it away. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Claire Hong. Um, I am a fourth year medical student at um, the Joplin campus and myself, Jana, Tara, and Anne-Marie, um, other fellow students will be presenting methamphetamine usage and associated medical and dental health outcomes today. So first, just some background. Methamphetamine is a highly addictive recreational drug that is used by thousands of Americans every year. It has historically been associated with the Midwestern and Southern regions of the US for various reasons. Several states within these regions have high rates of poverty, which poses a unique vulnerability for methamphetamine usage specifically as compared to other recreational drugs. So one of the reasons for this vulnerability is the inverted pricing model. The DEA found that as the purity of methamphetamine increases, price per gram actually decreases. That's, as you can imagine, pretty atypical compared to other recreational drugs, and it's dangerous because it increases the accessibility and thus the addictive potential of meth. Anecdotally, I'm sure that we've all in Joplin heard that meth is a huge issue within this community, so we were trying to extrapolate some reasons for why that might be. The inverted pricing model that I just discussed is probably the largest reason why, as Joplin has a significantly higher poverty rate than the national average. I think it clocks in at about 17%, which is actually also higher than the average for the state of Missouri. So this makes the decreased prices of pure methamphetamine more accessible for this population. Additionally, while most meth consumed in this country is now produced internationally, I think most predominantly in Mexico, back in the day, Missouri was the domestic meth production capital of the country. The high volume of meth use in Missouri nowadays is probably a consequence of those historical roots. Interestingly, just kind of as an aside, pseudoephedrine, which can be used as a precursor to make meth, has over-the-counter restrictions in only four states, one of which is Missouri. Joplin is one of the cities within Missouri that has this restriction in place. So after all this background research on meth, we headed into our early clinical experiences during our second year, and those experiences are what really revealed to each of us the extent of the meth problem in Joplin. We encountered so many patients who were either actively using or had recovered from using meth. And many of those patients have this rapid and extreme dental decay that is colloquially termed meth mouth. The poverty simulation put on by the school during our second year also provided some context for us as well. It helped to demonstrate how impossible it can be to prioritize health maintenance when faced with several socioeconomic barriers that are in place as a direct result of poverty. So putting all these experiences together, we became interested in learning about the medical and dental health outcomes affecting people who use or have used methamphetamine. As I'm sure that you guys all know, this is a population that is greatly overlooked by society as a whole, and also unfortunately within the healthcare industry. So this puts this population at risk for more adverse health outcomes in the long run. We hope that our findings provide social context and biomedical insights for physicians and other healthcare providers when engaging with this vulnerable population. For our study, we primarily used two parts. We had a social and a demographic survey as well as a school. Um, in total, we surveyed about 60 participants all from St. Peter's Outreach House, um, The Rock, or the Recovery Outreach Community Center, and Access Family Care all in Georgia. We had initially started mostly at Access Family Care and then St. Peter's Outreach to a small extent, um, but due to the COVID pandemic, we did have to take a hiatus. And then upon restarting data collection, we weren't able to return to access to this safety concerns with the pandemic. So at this point, we primarily found statistics um, at the Rock and Rock We also took the necessary precautions with COVID at this time and we wore the appropriate PPE like masks and gloves, face shields and gowns while speaking to all of our participants. Um, the participants were also each compensated with $5 Walmart gift card on service completion. 
Um, we split our participants into three separate cohorts. We had active users, recovered users, and never users of methamphetamine. Um, we defined a recovered user as someone who did not use for greater than 90 days. Um, this definition was made after many discussions with the workers and the community members, mostly at The Rock. Um, and just of note, many of our active users were found at St. Peter's Outreach House, while many of our recovered users were found at The Rock, and many of our non-methamphetamine users were found at Access Family Care. Um, the demographic data that we covered included sex, race, level of education, and occupation, which we have listed here on the charts on the right. Um, we did find that most of our patients were male. The racial makeup of most of our patients were white. Um, and many of our participants also had lower levels of education, mainly high school level or some on, uh, only some high school level of education. Um, so in order to avoid any confusion or misunderstanding with any of our participants, um, each of the researchers sat and read through each of the questions on the survey and provided explanations when necessary. Um, and lastly, looking at occupational data, we did find that most of our active users were unemployed. Um, fortunately, each cohort size was approximately equal in number, ranging from 17 to 24 per group. Um, the social data of the survey covered information mostly on chronic medical and dental disease, consistency of healthcare, COVID-19 infection history, and then other variables such as diet, alcohol, tobacco, other drug usage, and mode of drug use. Um, of note, given just how prevalent marijuana use is these days, we did have uh, many non-meth users um, say that they also used marijuana. Um, and to the left here, we have a picture of the poster, um, the exact poster that we used while recruiting participants for our study. Um, the fact that we were a student-led study and, and completely anonymous, I think really reassured people and made the participants feel comfortable enough to be so open and honest with us, especially with the more sensitive topic, um, such as their drug use history. Um, and with the saliva samples that we collected, we did initially hope to study the levels of IL-6, um, a marker of inflammation. And we had hypothesized that the levels of inflammation would be higher in active users compared to non-users. And we were really curious to see if maybe those levels would return to the normal baseline or not within the recovered group. Um, but due to COVID and that some necessary lab changes, we had to shift gears and refocus uh, more on like the biochemical analysis of the bacterial DNA that we've got from the saliva instead. Um, and that analysis is currently in its beginning stages. And I'm gonna let my colleague, Anne-Marie, speak more on that next. Um, um, so as she was saying, the initial part of the study wanted to focus on IL-6, um, but we kind of refocused and changed our gears and instead decided to look at the DNA makeup of the bacteria, um, specifically the end goal being to generate RFLPs. Um, so we started um, with our saliva samples um, and we actually only used non-users to begin with. We didn't want to um, continue doing the entire study until we verified that our methods were sound and would be able to generate the RFLPs until we tested it first on uh, non-user saliva. Um, the recovered and active user saliva is stored in a minus 80 degrees Celsius. Um, so what we did then with the non-user saliva is we streaked it onto plates of varying auger um, so you can see the image on the top, the leftmost auger is blood heart infusion auger. This is not selective, everything will grow on it. Um, so we uh, streaked onto the plates and isolated colonies and put them on this plate. Uh, we also put them on McConkie's auger, which is in the middle, the purple one. Uh, this is selective for gram negative bacteria. So if it grew on this plate, we knew it would be gram negative. And this was just to get a further um, distinction of the bacteria to further kind of classify the types of bacteria that can be found in the oral microbiome. And then finally, we streaked onto blood auger, which isn't selective for any type, but does show the hemolysis stage of the bacteria. Um, so again, this was just to further kind of classify and clarify the different types of bacteria that we could find in the oral cavity. So then once we um, grew these colonies onto auger, we isolated the genomic DNA. Um, using that genomic DNA, we then took it to PCR and used universal primers to create an amplimer of the 16S bacteria um, genetic makeup. So this image on the bottom is um, an image of 16S bacteria. It's unique to all those types of bacteria in that it has nine variable regions, 
with conserved regions uh, dispersed in between them. So we took the circled universal primers that are on here. Um, you can see it's 27F and 1492R. So what we did with those primers is amplified that region. Um, it's about a 1500 base pair region. Um, and so the idea then was to take this amplimer and cut it with a restriction enzyme. We used HAY3, which is a frequent cutter. It's pretty nonspecific. It cuts at the cut site CCGG. Um, so it's, it's a pretty frequent cutter in that that sequence comes up pretty often in DNA makeup. Um, so then after cutting with a restriction enzyme, we are left with RFLPs, which are restriction fragment link poly length polymorphisms. Um, and RFLPs are sort of like um, a fingerprint for different bacteria. So different types of bacteria will have different RFLPs. So then the thought is to compare different RFLPs between the three different groups. Um, but again, we just wanted to test it with the non-users first. So those are our methods. Okay, so moving on to some of our data and results, uh, we really wanted to determine whether we could find any statistically significant relationships between cohort, so cohort being active, recovered, or a never user, and some of our surveyed variables, which I will explain further. Um, we also wanted to further characterize some of the medical outcomes and general health habits of our participants. Um, of note, we used SPSS for all of our data and statistical analysis. So moving on to the actual results, uh, some of our significant findings were as follows. So number one, we found that active and recovered methamphetamine users were less likely to seek regular medical care than non-users. For the participants that, re that reported they were not comfortable seeking health care, we wanted to ask the reasons why. Um, and we found that the most commonly cited factor was financial reasons. So for to find this association between these two categorical variables, we, we used the chi-square test of independence to see if there was a significant relationship between them, i.e. cohort and seeking regular medical care. We set our alpha value to 0.05 for all of the tests. For this particular one, um, our p-value was 0.042, which is less than our alpha of 0.05. So that shows that there is a relationship or an association between cohort and seeking regular medical care. Um, when you look at sort of the cross tabulation, some of our expected counts, we could say that uh, active and recovered users were less likely to seek regular medical care than our non-users. So moving on to number two, we also found that the most common chronic medical diagnoses fell under cardiovascular, psychiatric, and chronic infectious disease. However, when we tried to look for a potential relationship between cohort and having one of these three types of diseases, we found that there was no statistically significant relationship, i.e. all of our p-values were greater than 0.05. The chart below just shows the chronic diseases we found broken down by body system. Um, although cardiovascular infectious and psychiatric disorders were the most common, we still found that a lot of our participants, about 41.7% of them, did not report any chronic medical diagnosis. Our third finding um, is related to our second one. We wanted to further characterize the specific types of medical diagnoses among our participants. Uh, hypertension, depression, anxiety, and hepatitis C are the most commonly reported diagnoses overall, with some of the other um, diagnoses listed in the table below. So in addition to seeking regular medical care, we also wanted to look at the relationship between cohort and seeking regular dental care. However, when we looked for a relationship between those two variables, we found that there was no significant relationship. So we couldn't comfortably say that there was an association between being an active, recovered, or non-meth users and whether or not you were more likely or less likely to seek regular dental care. Our p-value for that particular chi-square test was 0.418. However, when we are looking at cohort and other concurrent drug use, so drug use of other recreational drugs other than methamphetamine, we found that active methamphetamine users were more likely than their counterparts to use other types of recreational drugs. The p-value for this chi-square test was 0 0.001, and this is um, the table below just shows our cross tabulation. So for active users, the expected count is um, 1.4 and our actual count was five. So because it's higher than our expected count, we can say that they're more likely to use recreational drugs than their counterparts. Um, 
Related to that, we also found that recovered methamphetamine users were more likely to have used more than one drug type in the past. So that's a little bit wordy, um, but if you think about it, it makes sense because if active users are more likely to presently use more than one type of drug, then it makes sense that recovered users are more likely to have used multiple drug types in the past. And some of the statistical data is shown below. Um, our p-value for this particular chi-square was 0 0.008, which again is less than 0 0.05, which was our alpha value. Um, lastly, kind of looking at the big picture of, excuse me, of dental hygiene and care, we found that the dental hygiene habits among our participants were similar across all cohorts. Most of our participants reported that they brushed their teeth pretty frequently and regularly. With this in mind, we could you know, reasonably say that maybe the use of methamphetamine could be uh, one of the most significant contributors to major dental disease, or, or i.e. meth mouth in methamphetamine users. Just some of our other survey results, we also asked participants about their alcohol and tobacco use. Um, most of them did report um, using alcohol and tobacco as well. And then this slide is a visual representation of the dietary habits of our participants. We asked them about frequency of eating fast food, fruits and vegetables, red meat, and lean meat, um, because we know that diet is a pretty um, reliable predictor of health outcomes as a whole. And now I'll turn it over back to Anne Marie to talk about um, some of the RFLPs or the data related to that when it came to our non-users. Um, so again, these are just of non-users. Um, so the data presented here is pretty foundational and in its early stages. Um, but as you can see in the picture of the gel on the right, this Figure A is of the genomic DNA that we isolated. Um, so we isolated the DNA and then we ran it on a gel. We wanted to verify that we had successfully done that. And the gel proves that we did because there is a band at 23,000 base pairs. This is just a pretty widely accepted thing that if there's a band at 23,000, you have genomic DNA. Um, so this proved to us that we were able to successfully isolate the genomic DNA of the bacteria. Then when we put it through the PCR and the universal primers, we were able to successfully produce the amplimer that we wanted. Um, you can see the band at about 1500, which is what we kind of calculated for using the two specific universal primers that we picked. Um, so then after doing the PCR, we cut with Hay3 and were able to generate these RFLPs in image C. Um, so this is super exciting. It proves to us that our methods are sound and um, they work. So you can see in the RFLP data here, lane one is a ladder, but lane two and lane three, those are two probably really different types of bacteria because they have really different RFLPs. So they have a really different genetic makeup. Whereas in lane five and six, these look really similar. So if they're not the same type of bacteria, they have to be pretty closely related um, so this just proves to us that we are able to generate these RFLPs, and what we hope to do with this then is to take saliva samples from the recovered users and the active users and do all of this again and generate those RFLPs um, and then be able to compare them between the three groups and see if we notice any kinds of patterns or if we can um, see if any certain type of bacteria come up a lot for one group compared to the other, and then um, this could aid as health predictors for these groups um, using their oral bacteria makeup. So as proud as we are of this study, there were some, you know, several limitations. One major limitation was definitely the COVID-19 pandemic. We started writing up the plans for this study, I believe in late 2019. And so we started survey collection in early 2020. And we had gotten through about a third of our participants, I want to say 20 people, when everything started to shut down. So we took about a one year hiatus and when we resumed, the biggest issue was that Access Family Clinic couldn't have us back due to safety concerns in a clinical setting. This definitely threw a wrench in our plans because this is where we got the largest sample of participants with chronic medical issues. And then another problem was that in light of COVID, participants had to collect their own saliva samples without our help. There were some issues with understanding the instructions of the saliva collection and sometimes the saliva samples were unusable as a result. Another limitation was sampling. So, as you guys can imagine, we needed a very specific you know, group of participants. We needed people who were actively using or recovered from using meth. So our participants were clustered at the Rock and St. Peter's Outreach as a result. 
This allowed us to get this very niche population that we needed, but definitely raises issues with convenience sampling. In hindsight, we also should not have used open-ended survey questions as it related to medical conditions. There were some health literacy barriers where participants weren't always able to recall their own health conditions. We probably could have gotten around this by being more explicit in our survey and asking, you know, do you have any cardiovascular conditions and listing some options out? Do you have any GI conditions, listing some options out, so on and so forth. And lastly, degradation of salivary samples was another big concern. So most of our active participants, as uh, Claire mentioned, uh, we got them from St. Peter's Outreach. And kind of the setup at St. Peter's is they would go get their free lunch and then they would come to us to participate in the study. So the problem with that is a lot of the saliva samples ended up having like food particles in them, which obviously made them unusable. So moving on to discussion and conclusion, I think, as far as the social aspect of our study, one of the biggest takeaways for us was just the extreme differences between our own expectations versus reality. We definitely came into this with preconceived notions and we expected participants to be really suspicious and paranoid. Um, so we expected them to be really suspicious and paranoid of us. On the flip side, most of our participants were very open and honest and shared their personal life stories with us. The recovered users in particular gave insight into how childhood experiences and their own past traumas may have contributed to their addiction. They were able to walk us through how their addiction developed and their own struggles and successes with recovery. It was definitely a very moving experience and I think just eye-opening for all three of us, especially moving forward into our clinical years. Another thing that we kind of touched on earlier is that this is a population that is so overlooked societally as well as within the healthcare industry and medical field. So many of our participants were appreciative that we were even just there asking questions and giving them a platform and a voice because they've had so many experiences of being written off and judged by healthcare providers. Several of the participants that had chronic medical conditions actually stated that healthcare providers tended to operate under this bias that any medical complaints they had was like due to their drug use, which of course is not really fair. At the end of the day, regardless of social bias, addiction is a disease that affects so many people within this community. The purpose of our study was to shine light on these individuals and educate that they may have different medical needs than other populations. And it's important for physicians to be cognizant of that to optimize healthcare. Lastly, we intended for the study to be a pilot study and springboard for future research. We think that a really exciting further study could involve sequencing of the oral microbiome of our three cohorts. It would definitely be interesting to see if active users have different pathogenic bacteria that are potentially contributing to meth mouth, for example. It would also be cool to see if recovered users have different bacterial profiles compared to active users and non-users, like see if it remains as an active user's bacterial profile or kind of returns to a non-user's. So we think there are just some overall really interesting future studies that could come from this. We had many people to thank for this project becoming a reality. Um, first of all, Dr. Schottinger, he helped us a ton. Also Dr. Wells Lewis and Dr. Arntz. Um, we'd also like to thank the generosity of Access Family Care, St. Peter's Outreach and The Rock for allowing us to gather our participants there. Um, and lastly, I wanna thank my peers, Jana, Tara and Anne-Marie because um, without them, this wouldn't have come to fruition. So thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Let me say this. Uh, this is just one example of the excellent research efforts that are being uh, highlighted on the eye posters and live posters. So in the chat, you'll see I put a link that links directly to these student doctors poster. So feel free to visit that at any time. And we have time for questions. Anybody? Well, I might just jump here, jump in here and ask a question. First of all, thank you. That was really a very interesting presentation. Um, I think it gave us, gave us a lot to think about. Um, but my question is, uh, as you go forward in uh, analyzing the microbiome, I'm wondering if you could speculate a little bit, um, if you find differences in the makeup of the microbiome. Where do you think that might take you in terms of having an impact on these, these individuals? I know uh, a lot of speculation, but... I guess uh, I, I can try and answer this question. Um, potentially what we, we were hoping is, you know, if we know that there are a particular set of pathogenic bacteria, um, that exist in the oral microbiome of active users, then we could potentially predict 
and prevent uh, any sort of infection or major dental disease that occurs because of those pathogenic bacteria. Um, so I guess that's sort of what we were hoping or speculating could happen if, you know, we did find particular patterns in bacteria within these three cohorts. Yeah, and to add to that, I think, you know, one of the, the, the results that we found were that active users were actually seeking just as much dental care as non-users and recovered users. And so, you know, that gives people like dental professionals they have the ability to maybe work on preventing some of these issues because it's, these people are coming to see them. Awesome. Dr. Talley. Yeah, so we did a, um, an analysis, cluster analysis of um, the ED uh, admissions in the United States. And we found some of the things that really contradicted stereotypes were that in fact, homeless substance use disorder persons had <clears throat> coverage more often uh, at a far greater rate, as a matter of fact, than people who actually had homes but were low income. So that I suspect what has happened is as they came in to the ER, which they tended to use as their medical care because there wasn't the kind of follow-up and referral that uh, wasn't provided, they used the ER as the place to get treatment. And so they they actually were set up with insurance, probably by social workers. Um, and then another thing we found out was that if treatment was offered, uh, the vast majority of them would seek it, but that there wasn't, and this is a national, another national study that um, said that if treatment's offered, they'll seek it, but it is, it is not offered and it is not offered enough to um, reduce suicide rates and things like that for substance use disorder folks. So I think there's, there's just this huge constellation of things going on with these people that right now, a lot of our approach is based on stereotype rather than on fact. Just a comment. Thank you. Christian Vallejo and then Kennedy Renfro. Hi, um, I was looking uh, through your poster uh, while you guys were presenting. I was wondering, um, I know you mentioned uh, that you guys collected demographic information outside of uh, male, female. Um, I was wondering, um, did you include any other demographic information uh, like social, oh, I know you mentioned socioeconomic status uh, and housing condition. Did you run uh, any statistical information to figure out if that has any correlation with uh, recovery? Um, we didn't ask specifically in terms of like housing situation. Um, we did ask, you know, income level and education level as we, or I guess we asked about income level. So I guess that could be correlated. Um, I didn't, we didn't run any specific statistical analysis between, I guess, cohort and income level because so many of our participants fell, you know, within two brackets, all well within the poverty line. And so just, you know, from a statistical perspective, it would be very hard to find any sort of significant relationship if everyone sort of clustered in the same um, income brackets. And I think that just speaks to, you know, the, the poverty rate in Joplin and how prevalent it is. And so I think that just kind of hones in on just how vulnerable um, the population is here within the Joplin community and the surrounding communities as well, because we had plenty of participants who came to, you know, access or came to the rock from like, not just Joplin, like Web City and surrounding areas as well. Thank you. Kennedy Renfro, and then we'll move on to the next talk. Um, I was just wondering, did you guys look at like with specifically with your previous user go cohort, um, look at like the differences between like maybe the possible time that they did use methamphetamine versus um, maybe the time that they have like since recovered from such addiction, like if those had any um, differences in their results and that kind of a thing. So I can try and answer this too. And then uh, Tara and Claire, if you have any, any thoughts, like please feel free to jump in. Um, we definitely, I think from in hindsight, I could say that a lot of our participants who were in the recovered category who are well, you know, five to 10, even 15 years 
you know, post recovery from their addiction, we're much more health literate of health conditions they have. Um, and I think that's where, you know, knowledge of the fact that they have hep C or, you know, that they're managing their diabetes or hypertension came from. Whereas maybe I can't say for sure, maybe within some of our active populations, that sort of self-awareness in terms of their health wasn't as present because um, as we've mentioned, you know, just the, the types of obstacles that they face on a day-to-day -day basis make it harder for them to seek health maintenance um, than their recovered or non-using counterparts. Does that answer your question a little bit? Yeah, I think that also in hindsight, we probably should have stratified our recovered population a bit more because, you know, as we discussed, we gave it 90 days counted as recovered as like for the purposes of our study. And that was just because of discussions with people at The Rock. But at the end of the day, 90 days is going to have a different, you know, survey data than somebody who's been clean for four or five years, you know, or 10 years, as Jana had said. And so I think substratifying within our recovered is definitely as far as next steps, what we would do differently. And then also for results, something else that we might see later is after we're able to do more of the biochemical analysis, we might see if there's some differences between the recovered versus like the active users. Thank you folks, appreciate you.